and welcome to Counting Like It's 1479. Most of you watch this channel probably for my coverage of assembly language and obsolete video games. So today let's alienate all of you and talk about personal finance. I've had this as a bug in my head for a little while where I've been kind of obsessed with the lack of decent double entry tools for personal finance. Most of the software we use are tools like Quicken, which are essentially glorified checkbook registers. And I've been trying to convince people here and elsewhere that uh, really you want to consider going to double entry uh, for your personal finance. And I've been threatening for a while to make a video about it, and that's today. So you can't ask this question or suggest it without w wanting to know why is this important? Why would I as an individual rather than a business want to do any kind of double entry accounting? So there's a few reasons. First, and I think most importantly, finding errors becomes really, really easy when you're using double entry. I don't know about you, but my history with Quicken and Microsoft Money is that I'd start using it, I would use it for a few months, I'd really like the data I'd get out of it, and at some point I'd make a mistake. Maybe I'd make a couple of mistakes over time. And those mistakes start to add up and you go back and you try and find them and you just can't do it. Um, double entry accounting, double entry bookkeeping really, which is what I'm talking about here, will make finding those mistakes super easy. Second, it focuses on essentially three questions. How much did I make? How much did I spend? And how much do I own? And getting the answers to all three of those questions is going to be a lot easier if you're doing your bookkeeping and double entry versus if you are using a check register. So double entry has been around for a while since the, uh, the 1400s. Uh, Goethe said, it's among the finest inventions of the human mind. Every prudent master of a house should introduce it into his economy. And I love the idea of introducing things into my economy, so who could resist? So what are we talking about when we're talking about double entry bookkeeping? We're talking about a type of bookkeeping that allows us to implement the accounting equation. What's the accounting equation? It's this, assets equals liabilities plus equity. We'll define these terms in more detail shortly. There's actually an expanded version of this, which is assets equals liability plus equity plus income minus expenses. So what do these words mean? Assets is what you own. Liabilities, that's what you owe. Equity, you can think of that as what you owned before you started. Income, I think we all know that one, that's what you earn, and expenses are what you spend. So assets equals liabilities, plus equity, plus income, minus expenses. The history of double entry uh, bookkeeping is really fascinating. It was really popularized by a man named Luca Pacioli. He was a Franciscan friar who wrote a gargantuan book on geometry and algebra. It was meant to be a survey of all mathematics at the time kind of stuffed into the middle of this book was a very short 27 page essay. And this essay described how the merchants in Venice did their bookkeeping. The, this treatise, even today, if you can find a translation in your own language, it's simple enough for a kid to read and understand. Yet it forms one of the foundations of the modern economy. H.J. Uh, Mueller, a biographer, said, Luca Pacioli has probably had much more influence on human life than has Dante or Michelangelo. Okay, so this sounds good, but isn't it going to be difficult? Not particularly. The message that I want to give to you is that, yes, accounting is very hard. And when we think of double entry accounting, we think of the regulations and the tax implications and all the rules that businesses have to follow. But in your personal finance, you don't necessarily have to do most of that. You're just doing the bookkeeping part. And the bookkeeping is pretty easy. There are a few hurdles that you'll have to clear. Uh, first, the terms debit and credit are going to be everywhere. And those terms are going to be used in slightly unfamiliar ways. Second, um, if you're not using a computer, you'd be doing this on paper. And to do double entry on paper requires a lot of space, a lot of paper management, but we don't have to worry about that. Third, 
every entry that you're going to enter, every transaction is going to have to balance. That balancing is not difficult, but it does feel weird until you get used to it. And I think most people will get used to it very quickly. Lastly, if you've used Quicken or Microsoft Money, you're used to the idea of categorizing your expenses or categorizing your income. I went out to dinner, that's, uh, that's going to a restaurant. Uh, I, I went shopping for groceries. I'm gonna call that a grocery uh, category. Um, in double entry bookkeeping, instead of calling these things categories, we're going to call them accounts and we're gonna treat them like accounts. They have values that will change over time. That's gonna feel a little odd again, until you get used to it. One thing I should say, I'm not an accountant. Uh, certainly you shouldn't take this as personal financial advice, but my perspective is that there's plenty of people who don't do any bookkeeping at all. Uh, they get their bank statements, they check to make sure that they're making more money than they're spending, that the numbers in the account are going up. And if that's you, if that's enough for you, you know, I would say keep doing that. I think that if you're going to walk down the path of keeping books of your accounts, you need to do it right. And I would recommend not doing it at all if you're going to take the checkbook register approach to this. Um, people say that, well, you don't need to account for things down to the penny. I kind of disagree with that. I think if you're going to do it, you should jump in with both feet or else not at all. So there's a few things we want to talk about. What is this thing that we're doing? What are the what are the the practical the practical terminology that we're going to have to think about? Uh, so first, we can talk about debits and credits. Um, we can think of debits as something that increase an asset account, and a credit is something that decreases it. If you're talking about a liability account, that's reversed. This can be confusing for people because we think of uh, our bank accounts and when we um, put money in our bank account, we call that a credit. And the reason for that is that from the bank's perspective, the money you deposit in the bank is a liability. So that's why this terminology can, can be a little tricky at some times. Second, as we make our transactions, as I said before, they're all gonna sum to zero. We're gonna show examples of what exactly I mean by sum to zero soon. I mentioned the bit about income and expense being accounts, not categories. And we have, we're gonna have a special account type called equity. And equity is gonna represent everything we bring to the account books before we start keeping track of everything. Um, every account is only gonna handle one type of currency for most of us in the US, that's gonna be dollars. Um, if you have multiple accounts, if you have bank accounts in multiple countries, or if you're doing stock transactions, that's when this is gonna get a little more complicated. I'm not gonna cover those transactions today. If people like this video and wanna hear more, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's a future week. So, what are the steps involved here? There are three steps. First, we're gonna take a complete inventory of everything we own and everything we owe. Second, Every time we move money from one place to another, we're gonna write it down. We're gonna write it down in a specific way that makes all the transactions balance to zero. And step three is we keep doing step two forever. That's really it. There's uh, an optional idea of closing the books at the end of the year, uh, just to make the report reporting a little more clear as to what happened in what year. But frankly, that's optional and some people don't do it. Depends on what your needs are. So I've uh, cooked up a very simple fictional example of someone with a very simple financial life. So here's Alice. She has five grand in a savings account. She's got 3000 bucks in a checking account. She has a really nice salary, $1,000 a week before taxes. She's living in a very cheap location. So she only pays $300 a month in rent. Uh, and she pays uh, the national average of $250 a month in groceries. She does have a credit card that she uses for incidental expenses, but she pays it off every month. So let's go to the ledger. So as we said, Alice has $5,000 in her savings account. Let's say she started keeping track of everything this month. So we'll say on the 1st of June, she has an opening balance. 
and we're going to take, we're going to put the account name here, which is just her savings account. We're going to move some money into it. So we said $5,000. Now, this transaction right now does not balance to zero. We've put $5,000 into an account. So therefore, logically, $5,000 has to come from some other account. Um, the account we use when we are first getting started is this equity opening balances account. So we're going to put that in place. And we could uh, leave this blank, and, and most programs will know that we are saying that the entire amount should be going there. But let's be explicit since we're just getting started. We're going to do the same thing with Alice's checking account. And that's it in terms of the inventory portion of Alice's bookkeeping. As we said, she has a pretty simple financial life, so this didn't take us that long. Well, let's say that uh, on the 2nd of June, Alice gets her first salary. Well, that's going to be going into her checking account, right? But already we have a problem because we know that this is her gross salary. There's probably a deduction of some sort. And if we look at Alice's payslip, we see that out of that $1,000, 200 of it is going to go to taxes. So let's go ahead and put $800 in her checking account, $200 in taxes, and the total comes out to 1000 Now, I've put negative there because an income account, like an equity account, is usually denominated in negative, uh, I, I don't want to say dollars because it could be any currency, but negative currency. Money comes from the income account and flows into the other accounts. And if we wanted to continue using this program, this is what we would do. Every transaction we made, we would just enter it in. But I'm sure some of you are saying, this looks pretty burdensome. Isn't there an easier way for me to do it? The answer is, yes, there is. Let's flip over and look at GNU Cash. And so here we're looking at Alice's GNU Cash ledger. This looks a lot like Quicken or Microsoft Money. Uh, I'm not going to lie, it's a lot less polished looking. It, it doesn't look as slick. There's not as much UI, um, UI sugar. But it does get the job done, and it gives you, in my opinion, better than working with uh, just a plain text file. So you could see here, we have the same chart of accounts that we were working with uh, previously. We, we do have one or two extra accounts, like this imbalance thing going here. And if we look at the journal, we can see that we've done more or less the same um, transactions that we had been doing in the text file. I got the dates. Uh, different in this file. I do apologize for that. Um, we have one additional transaction here, which is that in the meantime, while we were changing programs, Alice went to Safeway and she went shopping. So she bought her entire month's worth of groceries at once uh, and she used her credit card to pay for them. So right away you can see that this is a lot more structured of a way to enter your data. You have fields for your various accounts. And if you make a mistake, the program will uh, rescue you a little bit. So let's say that at the end of, uh, well, I guess I'm, I'm committed to February here. So let's say on February 28th, Alice decides to pay her credit card. Her credit card is, she owes $250. We said she's gonna pay it all off. So she's gonna type 250 to my credit card. Great, I'm done. And she hits enter. Right away, GNU Cash flags this for us, that we have an imbalance. We said that we were sending money to the credit card account to pay it down, but we didn't say where that money was coming from. And it puts it in this special account imbalance. So this is what I was talking about when I said it makes it very easy to find errors. Since this is an account and not just a category, I could actually go and look at just this account and look at every item in it, anything in the imbalance account, is a mistake. So let's go back to our journal here and fix that. Uh, she's going to pay that out of her checking account. And just like that, we've now taken money out of her checking account and put it into her credit card account. If we look at 
some of the charts we get, we could see that at this point, Alice is making more than she's spending. She has a profit, that's this green line over here. Uh, if we don't wanna look at it in a kind of visual format, we could get a report. And that report shows us that her major expenses right now are grocery and rent, uh, as well as federal taxes. Um, and her only source of income thus far is one week's salary. Um, I haven't yet entered the, uh, the other salaries here. So the other thing I'll point out here is that in addition to this journal view, this lets us do something similar to what we would do in Quicken or Microsoft Money and say, just show me the, the checking account. Give me something that looks more like a bank register. So you do have that view available to you. And you could also get what's called a balance sheet, which is Alice's complete financial picture. Everything Alice owns and everything she owes is listed right here. In fact, since I generated this report before Alice paid off her credit card, you can see that her liability shows up here and is deducted from her net worth. And really, that's all I wanted to talk to you about today. I wanted to make the case for doing double entry for your own personal finances. And I wanted to show you that at least for the simple cases, it isn't that hard. You can get started at a very low cost both in terms of dollars, but also in terms of effort. And if you want to do something more ambitious, if your personal finances are more complicated than Alice's, as most of us are, most of ours are, uh, it really isn't that much work above and beyond that. If you have a specific question about how you would use this to do bookkeeping for a more complicated case, leave it in the questions below. For those of you who came here for assembly language and old video games, next week it's pretty likely that we will be back to our normal schedule. Thanks for watching.